The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalo Valyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Hello learners. Welcome to this learning program. I am Tasso Gerard, your economics teacher for Upper C Art. Before we start this particular session, let's look at the assignment I gave during the last session. This was the assignment. How may the imposition of a tax affect A. The distribution of income B. Prices and C. Consumption So let's take a look at the solution. How the imposition of the tax affects the distribution of income? Income taxes are progressive in nature. Progressive, that is, they tend to take more percentage from the from high income earners and lesser percentage from lower income earners. They are progressive in nature and therefore reduce income inequality by redistributing income in favor of the poor. That is for income tax and income taxes are more are direct taxes. Indirect taxes are regressive in nature and tend to widen the gap between the poor and the rich. So indirect taxes are regressive in nature. To widen the gap between the poor and the rich. And progressive taxes will tend to narrow the gap between the poor and the rich. That is how taxes will affect the distribution of income. Let's take another, uh, the next. How the imposition of a tax affects prices of goods and services. Indirect taxes are inflationary as the cost price increases. Now, how the cost price increases? When an indirect tax is imposed, most often it will cause the, it's a, an indirect tax is like an increase in cost of production. Firms will be compelled to, to uh, increase their prices because the, the supply, everything being equal, will fall as a result of an increase in those uh, taxes. So they'll be forced to increase the price of their commodity, depending, however, on the elasticity of demand for that particular commodity. If it's highly inelastic, then they'll shift the burden to consumers through higher prices, and that could be inflationary. On the other hand, direct taxes will tend to reduce prices because direct taxes, like an income tax, mean, uh, implies a reduction in purchasing power and a fall in aggregate demand. So when demand is falling, prices are compared to fall. Everything being equal. A rise in indirect taxes as an explanation, the rise in indirect taxes will raise the general price level as measured by the retail price index. As a price index, the index that shows the average change in prices, a basket of commodities over a given period of time, as measured by the retail price index. This may result to inflation. Then, uh, direct taxes could reduce inflationary pressure by lowering aggregate demand. The aggregate demand is reduced. It, uh, prices are going to fall. How it affects consumption. Direct taxes reduce disposable income and hence consumption. While indirect taxes will reduce the total demand for goods and services. Why? Because indirect taxes will cause prices to rise. Higher prices will reduce goods purchasing power and hence consumption fees. Uh, prices are rising as a result of the indirect tax. 
it will lead to a reduction in consumption. Now, let's look at uh, the lesson of today, which is uh, lesson 28. It is based on notions of budget. Lesson is based on notions of budget. Now, before we get totally into the lesson, let's uh, look at a plan that we're going to follow. We'll start by the lesson objectives. And then we'll, take the, we'll look at the previous knowledge, problem situation, lesson activity, that's the lesson itself. We'll get some exercises and we'll end up with an assignment which will be corrected in the next class. Let's start with the objectives. By the end of this lesson, students should be able to identify the types of budget equally should be able to differentiate between automatic and uh, discretionary fiscal policies. Let's look at the previous knowledge. Students or learners can identify the consequences of taxation. Real life situation, the mayor of your locality discovers that Many households in the municipality are unable to pay their bills on time, despite the fact that most of them earn regular income. The mayor of the locality discovered that many households in the municipality are unable to pay their bills on time, despite the fact that most of them earn regular income. We get a question. What advice would you give these households to enable them manage their income efficiently. So what advice will you give these households to enable them manage their income efficiently? By the end of this lesson, we'll see how this question can easily be resolved. Definition of the national budget. National budget is defined as an estimated account of government income and expenditure for the coming financial year. That's national money. It gives an estimate of what the government uh, plans to spend and what she plans to receive as income the coming financial year. That is uh, the budget. There are different types of budgets. We we'll work with three main types for the moment. The budget surplus, a budget deficit as well as a budget uh, 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 balanced budget. We have a surplus, a deficit, and a balanced budget. We'll look at them detail. Let's start with uh, the first balanced budget. Now let's work with the budget surplus first before we go to the others. Now, what is a budget surplus? It is simply when government income is planned income is more than her plans expansion. That's when government plans go, uh, income is greater than government's plans expansion. That is when T is more than G. T stands for taxes because, you know, the main source of government income comes from taxes. So when T is greater than G, we are talking about the budget surplus. When government plans to spend less, but receive more, especially from taxes, that is a budget surplus. Now, what are the reasons for adopting a budget surplus? These are some of the reasons. One of the most important points is to check inflation and economy. Now, a budget, when taxes represent a withdrawal, when taxes are imposed, money is withdrawn, and uh, that will tend to reduce uh, purchasing power will determine the economy and it will help to control inflation if there was a high rate of inflation in that economy. It equally permits the government to avoid borrowing. When you operate at the surplus, it means that you have some reserve that you'll be able to use in when uh, during rainy days. To have funds to repay debt incurred during a deficit, that could equally be a reason. You have enough funds to pay to repay your debts that you incurred during when you were running a budget deficit. Now let's look at um, 
what the budget deficit, deficit itself uh, means. It occurs when planned government income is less than planned government expenditure. That is, when G is greater than T or T is less than G. That's when the government plans to spend more and take less from taxes. That's a budget deficit. So under which circumstances, under what circumstances will the government adopt a budget deficit? Probably it could be to solve unemployment. Unemployment, when you have a situation where there are many persons who are willing and able to work, who are unable to get jobs in relation to your qualification, the government could intervene through a budget deficit by spending more. That's an expansionary, expansionary policy. When you spend more, it uh, leads to an increase in the uh, aggregate demand in the economy, and firms will be motivated to produce more because demand is high. Firms are going to try to expand, and to expand, they'll need to hire workers. That will help to reduce unemployment. To increase the rate of economic growth, that can equally be another objective of a budget deficit. Economic growth is a um, especially potential growth, increase in the uh, productive capacity of the economy can easily be increased through a budget deficit. When the government spends more money enters into circulation, economic activities will tend to flourish, investment, and so forth. To reduce a deflationary gap in an economy, deflation is where there's a persistent fall in the general price level. Persistent fall in the general price level. The deflationary gap, of course, occurs when the economic income is less than the full employment income. Now, this gap can be reduced through a budget deficit. Reduced through a budget deficit. Now, let's look at the balanced budget. That's the third type, balanced budget. This occurs when the government plans to spend exactly what she gets from her uh, income. That's when planned government income is equal to planned government expenditure. That's when G equals T. That is a balanced budget. But surprisingly, a balanced budget does not have a neutral effect on the economy. The balanced budget will instead will end up having a, an expansionary effect because there is a difference between the government tax multiplier and the government multiplier rather and the tax multiplier. The government must play as an expansional effect more than the contractional effects of the tax multiplier. That is why, even with the balanced budget, you end up realizing you have, uh, you'll be able to realize an expansion in economic activities, taking care of uh, unemployment. Let's just look at the reasons for a balanced budget. Stabilize the economy, avoid borrowing, Ensure a steady rate of economic growth, meaning that economic growth can still be achieved even with a balanced budget, since it does not have a neutral effect on the economy. So it also permits the government to avoid borrowing. It helps also to stabilize the economy. Now, let's go to discretionary fiscal policy. This is a deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxation to influence certain policy objectives. Deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxation to influence certain policy objectives. And we know the main instrument of fiscal policy is the budget, which, which we've just seen. The budget is the main instrument of fiscal policy. We saw the three types, deficit, surplus, and the balanced budget. So it's a deliberate manipulation of G and T, that's government expenditure and taxes, to permit government attain certain policy objectives. Policy objectives here, we're thinking of uh, objectives like full employment, price stability, the steady rate of economic growth, equitable display of income, and so forth. Now let's look at the advantages of fiscal policy. Before the advantages, we know fiscal policy can be an expans expansionary or a contractionary fiscal policy. Expansionary when uh, we are talking about if you are operating a budget uh, deficit, deficit is an expansionary fiscal policy because you 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 putting in more money in circulation and withdrawing less, and the surplus becomes a contractionary 
uh, policy. Now, what are the advantages? They can be used to achieve selected objectives. This means that it is possible for the government to discriminate in the use of the, its expenditure. This selected objective will be a little bit difficult if we were to talk of monetary policy. Mm -hmm. Given that probably the policy on reducing bank rates is very typical, it's typical to target a particular industry. But the, the fiscal policy, particular sector, particular industry can easily be targeted. It has direct impact on the econo economy when the government increases its expenditure. So it has direct impact. Expenditure is increased, everything being equal, it leads to an increase in uh, economic activities, probably uh, investments, consumption, and so forth. They help to reduce the extent of income inequality in the economy. So fiscal policy will actually help to narrow the gap between, can help to narrow the gap between the poor and the rich. And say so it helps to reduce the extent of income inequality in the economy. They complement automatic stabilizers. Actually, automatic stabilizers are built in mechanisms that help to reduce the amplitude of cyclical fluctuations in economic activities. So they actually complement automatic stabilizers. We'll look at automatic stabilizers a little bit uh, later. Now, these are the advantages. Let's look at the disadvantages of fiscal policy. Inflexibility. That's the first. Inflexibility. Changes are very difficult with the fiscal policy. The budget cannot easily be changed to take care of changing economic situation. Now, for the budget to be changed, probably parliament needs to be convened. You need to hold the parliamentary session. It takes time. It takes time. So, it does not just change uh, within a very short period. So, there is some inflexibility. The time lag. Time, there is usually a time lag before the measures take effect. Hence, the policy may affect the economy when economic conditions have changed. So there's some time interval that it takes for it to actually, uh, for the effects to be realized. A very good policy, fiscal policy will be adopted by the time it takes effect, things have actually changed. It is characterized by a lot of uncertainty. There is no guarantee that the economy would always respond as anticipated. There is no guarantee that the economy will always respond as anticipated. For instance, the government might decide to increase direct taxes, income taxes, with the intention of reducing purchasing power, or with the intention of um, yeah, reducing purchasing power in order to solve a problem of inflation. But surprisingly, Households might instead decide to reduce their savings and maintain their purchasing power. Or better still, they work extra time, maintain their living standards, and that object will not be realized. So it will not always uh, respond as anticipated. It may have undesirable effects on different government objectives. A measure designed to achieve one objective may have on intended adverse effects on other objectives. So they, they will tend to conflict. A measure designed to achieve one objective may have unintended adverse effects on other objectives. Imagine a measure that is intended to achieve a faster rate of economic growth, mm -hmm. probably by using um, deficit budgeting so that more money, more average demand should increase. By the end of the day, discover that you are forcing prices to rise and that is creating an inflationary situation. Okay, this is um, uh, all as far as uh, fiscal, discretionary fiscal policy is concerned. Let's now look at automatic fiscal policy or what we call automatic stabilizers. These are elements of fiscal policy which regulates the level of economic activity without direct government intervention. They regulate the level of economic activity without direct government act, uh, intervention. They are built in mechanisms into the economy that work automatically to reduce 
fluctuations in the level of economic activity. So they are built in, they are built in by the government, but they are allowed to function automatically in order to reduce the amplitude of cyclical fluctuations in economic activities. A very good example of automatic stabilizers would be progressive taxes and the unemployment benefits. We we'll see that with progressive taxes, these are taxes that when your income is rising, more percentage is taken automatically. They have been built, built like that. So it means that when the economy is getting towards a boom, economic activities are flourishing. Many persons are going to be pushed up to higher income brackets and automatically more money will be taken away from them because of the progressive taxes, thereby dampening the increase in average demand. It will prevent average demand from rising the level at the level which it would have risen without the progressive taxes. Now, on the other hand, when incomes are falling, when the economy is getting towards the depression, automatically what is going to happen is that low income earners, they will start less amount of tax will be taken, taken out of the non more will take less so as not to reduce their income significantly. Because if you just have, if it was a flat rate, income might have to go very low. So by so doing, the progressive taxes help to reduce the amplitude of fluctuations on the trade cycle. It's equally a bit similar with unemployment benefits. When the economy is getting towards a boom, economic activities are flourishing, unemployment benefits are not going to be paid again because uh, workers are now having jobs. So automatically, unemployment benefits would reduce, thereby reducing the increase in aggregate demand. And uh, as the economy is getting towards the depression, economic activities are going slow, economy, um, things are getting bad, unemployment benefits automatically increase. More persons are unemployed, so there'll be un unemployment benefit. That prevents income from getting towards a very or to a very low level. The presence of unemployment benefit will prevent the incomes from getting to a very low level. So they also have to regulate or narrow the fluctuations in their economic activities. So let's look at the advantages of building stabilizers. They act independently of government intervention as an advantage. The time lag required for them to go into effect is considerably small. They are less expensive to the government. That's equally an advantage. Government do not need to build structures for them to uh, go into operation. They are non-discriminatory. Since uh, there are no structures to control, no administrative bottlenecks are involved. No bottlenecks are involved. They give the government ample time to occupy herself with other pressing issues. So the government has time. Things, they work automatically. The government has time to concentrate on other pressing issues in the economy. They help discretionary measures succeed as they operate before any such measures take effect. So they are complementary. As we earlier saw, they prevent excessive increases and falls in aggregate demand, which guarantees stability. So they help to stabilize the trade cycle. Now let's look at its advantages. They only come into effect when damage has already been done. What does it mean? It means that they cannot prevent damage from being done. They do not provide long-lasting solutions to a problem. Their solutions are just temporary. They must be complemented by fiscal measures, by discretionary fiscal measures for them to be long-lasting. They may not be significant enough to overturn a major instability in the economy. These are the disadvantages. Now, we are already getting to the summary. That's trying to recall. I want to recall all what we've done in this particular lesson, we started with the definition of a budget, and a budget we define as a financial statement which sets out estimates of government expenditure and revenue for the coming year. So that's a budget. Then we looked at the types of budget. There are three types that we saw, the budget surplus, budget deficit, and the balanced budget. We equally looked at the discretionary fiscal policy, which is defined as a deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxation 
to influence certain policy objectives, which are the objective could be full employment, price stability, uh, steady rate of economic growth, and so forth. Automatic stabilizers, there are built-in mechanisms in the economy that work automatically to reduce fluctuations in the level of economic activity. We saw that. So we're going straight now to exercises. We look at some exercises. We start with the first. Which of the following is a fiscal measure? A. Anti. A is anti-pollution legislation. B. Changes in the rates of interest. C. Restrictions on bank lending. D. Government grants to private sector firms. Which of the following is a fiscal measure? Now, remember fiscal policy talks of G and T. Government expenditure, manipulating government expenditure and uh, our income. So the best answer here should be government grants to private uh, sector firms. This one has to do with government expenditure. So the right answer here is, uh, is D, government grants to private sector. Residual on bank lending, this one has to do with monetary policy. Rate of interest also is a monetary policy and so forth. Anti-pollution, legislation, that one should be a physical, physical policy. Okay, we'll get, we'll get to exercise two. If government spending exceeds tax collection, A, private saving is positive. B, if government spending exceeds tax collection, public saving is positive. C, there is a budget deficit. D, there is a budget surplus. So if G is more than T, we are talking about a budget deficit because the reverse of the would have been a surplus. So the right answer here is a C, budget deficit. Let's get to the next exercise. Which of the following will likely raise government expenditure? A, an aging population. B, a rise in employment. C, a fall in the rates of interest. D, a decrease in, in the school living age. Which of the following will likely raise government expenditure? Uh, in this case, an aging population will be a burden to the government. A should be the better option. Right answer is A. A rise in employment will not employment increases, the government might easily have more income, will not be a burden. Fall in the rate of interest is not a burden. Decrease in school living age. So the correct answer there is uh, is A. The expenditure will increase with an aging population. You need to pay pension, take care of great probably old people's homes and so forth. Uh, at the same time, less taxes are going to be generated. Okay, we we'll now look. We we'll now take um, down this assignment in our books. How may a government use fiscal policy to fight inflation and unemployment? How may a government use fiscal policy to fight inflation and unemployment? This assignment will be corrected in our next uh, next lesson. References. You you check. You could check um, on these references. Stanley's Institute of Economics, seven edition by uh, Barry Harrison, Institute of Economics, London. Uh, that's 1992. Mr. Gerard, Advanced Economics. Destiny Prince Publishers. That's what Gerard Success in A Level Economics here on the Grass Publishers. Okay, this is where we're going to end for today. In our next session, we'll be looking at program budgets. Mane tambia ninyane njobya yen Tam tama mote tamzabike 
Tem tem atonge, tem zabike, tem 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 amote, tem zabike. Mane tem bia ninja, ninja bia yen. 